started here. Amen. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. And when you hear what the Holy Ghost teaches you, you will have great peace. All my children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace. They shall be far from oppression, as God's word delivers you from oppression. Amen. Hallelujah. It's not your duty to give, it's your opportunity to give. God is adding fruit to your account when you give. Hallelujah. And God enables the giver. He gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Amen. And he enables, hallelujah, the work of the Lord through his power upon the people's giving. Hallelujah. Life is giving and life is living. Life is a cycle of receiving and giving. Hallelujah. That's a spiritual life cycle. We have a spiritual intelligence, not by the wisdom of what man teaches, but what the Holy Ghost teaches, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. To have a spiritual intelligence. Paul said in Romans 8, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. You can have an emotional intelligence, but I would rather have the original intelligence of God in Christ Jesus and not a phony one, not a religious one, not a counterfeit one, one that has power to save them that believe. That's the power of the gospel. I don't settle for anything less. Jesus is Lord, and when he's preached and his truth is preached, signs and wonders follow the truth of Jesus Christ. Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, teaching and warning that we may present everyone perfect in Christ Jesus. Satan doesn't want you to know that mystery. Doesn't want you to know his big mistake that he made when he crucified the Son of Glory. If he would have known what was going to happen to us in that crucifixion, he would not have crucified him. And now he's trying to cover it up and blind people from the mystery of the cross and the power of the new you that's in that spiritual intelligence. God is all wise. Satan was fooled by God. The weak things of God destroyed Satan's powers. The foolish things of God destroyed Satan's power. Doesn't that make you happy? That God chose the foolish things. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting awake today. Because we're going to enter in to the grace of God and have great peace from the word of God, what the Holy Ghost teaches. <laughs> The only one, Jesus, that you're ever going to want to know is the Holy Ghost Jesus, not the man-made version. Amen. So I thank God for his love to teach us the truth today. The Bible says that he may speak the truth in love, that we may grow up into Christ in all things. And I'm so thankful. It is a miracle of what God is doing around the world with such a small seed in this house, meeting great needs in the world around us. A small seed meets a great need. That seed declares to the empty ground a forest. That empty ground doesn't know what's coming to hit it when the seed of God's word is planted in it. Hey, when the seed of God's word is planted in it, Pakistan will see Jesus. And they are seeing Jesus. Last time I was in there, a blind woman's eyes were opened in the middle of the message. Come running up. She had been blind all her life, and, and I saw the tears running down her eyes. Another time, we were just preaching the truth that's in Christ Jesus, and a little girl had never spoken in her life, started speaking. And the whole family came to Christ. And so we're so thankful that Jesus is still alive, and his gospel is still the power to save them that believe. Amen. And so we're so thankful that God gives grace. He gives grace. For everything we do. He empowers us, enables us in everything we do to get the gospel to the nations. And so this little group of people here, it's amazing what it's like feeding the 5,000 with just a few loaves and some, and, and God is enabling the grace that he gives on people to give. God will make all grace abound towards you. Second Corinthians chapter uh, 8 verse 9. And then 9 verse 8 is a good one too. I always get those two mixed up. 9, 8, and 8, 9. 
One says that you know the grace of God, how Jesus became poor, that you might become rich. Hey, okay, that's the grace of God. The grace of God makes a person rich. There is no doubt about it. The Old Testament calls it the blessing of the Lord. The New Testament calls it the grace of God. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. Or you could say the grace of God in the New Covenant abounds towards someone having all sufficiency in all things at all times. Can you just imagine that? Can you imagine being the person that that word was spoken to? Because God was talking to people. He wasn't just talking to vain philosophy. He wasn't just trying to get a book that would be published and become on the, uh, you know, the New York Times bestseller list. No, he was speaking to people to get blessed by the word that he said is spirit and life. And he said, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency in all things at all times may abound unto every good work. That's the grace that's working in this house right now. It's the grace that supplies the need to abound unto every good work. And we're going to keep abounding and keep abounding and keep abounding and going into more countries and more nations and more peoples and tongues and tribes. We're going to just keep abounding because God's grace is in this house. His blessing is in this house. Amen. we got good givers that know the truth about their giving that's living, and it causes the gospel to go forth. It enables us to preach the gospel. It enables the minister. So thank God, fruit to your account, that every single soul that gets saved, hallelujah, in the person who's giving, is accounted to them as much as it is the preacher that's preaching. Amen? This is a group effort. This is the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so we just thank God that he's able to establish us in his grace to abound more and more, to abound more and more. His grace is his blessing. His grace is his power. His grace is his anointing. His grace is a supernatural way of living. By grace through faith, we are saved, and that's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It's a spiritual faculty that comes from God. You could call it a sixth sense. You could call faith a sixth sense. It's a sense that gets birthed into your faculties of life when you get born again. All you got is five senses. But when you get born again, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. That you get born into the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave his life for you. He gives you his faith to do his will for his glory. So you can't brag about it because it's a gift. It's a gift of faith. And so faith produces the peaceable fruits of righteousness. If you go to Philippians chapter 1, it says that we are filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus. Fruits of righteousness. That means a righteous person has fruits of a faith life that comes from God and not from man. It's a faith life. It's a peace life. It's a confident life. It's an abundant life that Jesus said in John 10.10. 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It's the faith life of Jesus that you get by grace. You don't get it by earning it. You don't get it by being so smart in yourself. You get it by humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. Amen. So God enhances all our faculties, and then he gives us the faith to live by. For the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Or you could say the just by faith will have life that comes from God. A God life. It's a faith life. Praise God. Faith is something that remains out of the three of love and hope and faith. These three are eternally remaining. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. John 3, 16. God so loved the world. You know that little word so is an important adjective. You know, so loved. That means he really loved. That means he means business. That means he's serious about his love. God so loved. He really loved mankind. He really did. Do you really believe it? God so loved the world. Do you so believe it? I so believe it. Amen. If he so said it, I so believe it. And that so settles it. Hey, hallelujah. If he said so and put such a strong adjective to his love, not just any ordinary kind of love, 
but the God kind of love, the love that gives faith for a world you're living in to overcome. Amen. God gives you overcoming faith because he loves you so much. He doesn't want you to lose uh, out on any good and perfect gift that comes from him from above. Praise God. Let's go to Romans, the last chapter, Romans chapter uh, 16. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm going into Pakistan tomorrow morning from a Saturday meeting. Now it's a Monday meeting, Monday evening meeting. There's going to be a big crowd of people there. Amen. And they're going to believe the word of God. Amen. And God's going to witness to them with his spirit that their believing is accomplishing the work of God through faith. They're going to have the witness that they are born again. Hallelujah. When I walk around town, you know, there's fish that are swimming everywhere. Swimming in moose jaw. Swimming in, swimming out, going here, going there. And, and my spirit's just got my line out. I'm just, I'm fishing in my spirit. I'm looking for those. Him. And God says, all who call upon his name shall be saved. Not maybe, not hopefully, not when they attend church 10 weeks in a row or go to a program. No, because, listen, listen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, my speech and my preaching was not with the wisdom of enticing words, was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, But in the demonstration of the power of God, that you may know that your faith is in God and not in the wisdom of men. I didn't come to you with the wisdom of men. I came to you with the demonstration of the Spirit of God and power to tell you that my gospel works. It saves them that believe. My gospel is the power of God to save them that believe. And when somebody hears that and they call upon the Lord and they confess that Jesus is Lord, and they believe that God raised him from the dead. Because God raised him from the dead. So if God raised him from the dead, it's a good time to start believing that. Amen. That means, if God raised him from the dead, that means that we have a living Savior that can raise us from the dead. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us to raise us from the dead so we can walk in the newness of life in the same life that Jesus walked into when he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. So when you say that, it, it, it sounds, you know, you got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. you got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, if you're believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then what do you think is influencing that person to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? The power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is the ministry of a living Christ that still is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Still heals, still delivers, still fills hearts with joy. He still pours his spirit upon people that are thirsty, and he's the same. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ is revealed by revelation of the Holy Spirit in the Word. So when a person believes that Jesus is risen from the dead, what they're believing is that God's power is there right now to deliver them and heal them. So if you believe in the gospel that's being preached that influences the thought processes to convince a person that Jesus died on the cross and that was enough for God to take away all your sins and he rose from the dead to testify that it's true, then you can believe it and be delivered from the powers of darkness and be translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And the good news about Jesus Christ is that in the cross is the real you, not in Adam. Praise God. And so let's look at this chapter 16, verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. The gospel establishes people 
in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not a counterfeit knowledge, not a phony knowledge, not a religious knowledge, not an empirical knowledge, but a revelation knowledge that comes into the new spirit that is recreated in Christ Jesus. A knowledge that's above the princes of the power of the air, that's above the knowledge of humanity. This kind of knowledge was above Satan. And if he would have had that kind of knowledge, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. So this is the kind of knowledge which the Holy Ghost teaches, which is kept secret until a person receives it from above. The secret of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's keep reading here. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. According to the revelation of the mystery. Have you ever thought about that? What is the revelation of the mystery? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What is the revelation of the mystery? That's so powerful that Satan wants everybody to be blinded about it because he failed. He made a big mistake and he's trying to cover it up. He shouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, but he did because he doesn't have the wisdom of God or the power of God or the knowledge of God. But God had knowledge to save us through that mistake, that foolishness of Satan, that weakness of the pride of the, of the devil. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I've been thinking about why is this mystery so important? Why is this mystery so important? Now, here's what Paul's saying. If I don't have the power of God, if I don't have a living Christ, if I don't have the demonstration of the power, if I cannot produce any proof, then I have to resort to the gimmicks and devices of human wisdom. If you don't have the power of God, then the only thing you have is uh, religious intelligence. That's all you got. It's religious intellectualism. Paul said, I don't have religious intellectualism. I'm not having a debate with anybody. I'm proclaiming the risen king. I'm not having a debate. This is not a question and answer period. This is not an alpha course. I'm telling you, Jesus is alive and he died on the cross because he loves you and he took away your sins and he has a new you for you hidden in the cross that you have come into through my preaching. You have come in to the knowledge of the glory of God that reveals to you Christ in you, that reveals to you a new man, that reveals to you the born again life, the experience of God for mankind in Christ, the experience of God for mankind in Christ, the mystery that was hid from the foundation of the world is now made known in Christ Jesus and through the cross of Jesus Christ. And nobody ever who knows that truth that sets them free has ever, ever, ever got to resort and go back and lower themselves to religious intelligence ever again. Amen. I'm not up for a debate. There's no debate. Moses' snake swallowed up all the other ones. There was no debate. The devil doesn't like the power of God. Religion doesn't like the power of God. But those that are suffering and hurting and needing love the power of God. They love the power of gospel. They love the power that saves them from their sins and their infirmities and their sicknesses. Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins might live unto righteousness by whose stripes we have been healed. We have been healed by his stripes. There's healing in his stripes. We preach uh, the Christ. We preach the cross and the revelation of his resurrection from the cross brings people into salvation by faith. They, re they believe it, that God loves them. They believe it, that Jesus took their sins. Jesus uh, killed and put away and reversed every curse that Adam brought to the human race. Adam made many sinners. Jesus killed that sinner on the cross. He buried that sinner. So when you come to Christ, you can have a funeral. And then you can have a celebration of a new birth. Hey, dead to the old, 
The Bible says we are dead and our life is hid with Christ in God. So you can have a funeral because when Jesus died, you died. And God wants you to know that you've died. Because Jesus died, and Jesus didn't die for himself. He could have just went to glory without dying, but he died so you could die. And he rose so you could rise and walk in the newness of life. And that's your salvation. Praise God. That's your deliverance. That's your healing. That's your faith. That's your joy. That's your righteousness. The rightness that Jesus, the only human being in the race after Adam sinned, the only human being, Jesus Christ had the righteousness of God. He was right with God. And that rightness he had with God, he gave to you. Because nobody could get right with God. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in the sight of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being freely justified by faith in the blood of Jesus, whom God has set to be a propitiation for our sins. So there's no judgment, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus that believe that when Jesus died, he killed the sinner that Adam created through rebellion in siding with Satan. This is a spiritual intelligence that will give you great peace. Huh? Hey? Huh? Praise God. What God has done for us in Christ is yet to be revealed. Hey, it's yet to be revealed. It's yet to be revealed. Look at it. Hold your finger in there. Well, I might as well tell you this here anyway, and then we'll, we'll go to, uh... yeah. First Corinthians chapter 1. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews. It's a stumbling block. How could someone who's being, because they crucified a lot of people in, in Rome. That was their, their method of, of, of death, of the capital punishment upon criminals. So how could the capital punishment on this man named Jesus be salvation for the world. That's just a stumbling block to the religious. To the religious intelligence, it doesn't make any sense. Without a demonstration of the power of God, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's just foolishness. It's a stumbling block. And under the Greeks, foolishness. Where we get the Greek word moron from. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, which things are despised, God has chosen. Yeah, the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. He's put you in Christ Jesus. And if you look at the, at the story of Noah and the ark, God put Noah in the ark. God closed the door. God locked him in. God sealed him in the ark. It wasn't the ark that kept him from drowning. It was the seal of God upon him that kept the ark from sinking. Amen? If you read that, God sealed Adam, uh, Noah in the ark. Just like God seals us in Jesus like an ark. Puts us in Christ, even though we in Christ can't do what, what, what God would want us to do because of the weakness of the flesh, God has sealed us in Christ. So what Christ has done is added to our account as if we had done it ourselves.
So God saved Jesus, and we're in Jesus, so we have salvation. Like God saved that ark. His seal was on that. And anyone in the ark, no matter what they were like, was saved. So the sinner in Christ is saved and made righteous as if he has never sinned and given a new birth and given a faith life and given an opportunity of a lifetime to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to chapter 2 here. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it? Look at this. Verse 6. Are you up there? Verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. How be it? How be it? Those that are born again, those that are in Christ, those that have identified themselves with this ark. Verse 31. Verse 30 of the first chapter but of God are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Now, chapter 2 follows this, and he's saying, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We've got wisdom. Jesus is our wisdom. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. In a mystery. The mystery of God revealed to us through Christ and us receiving him humbly as uh, believing that we need uh, his salvation, no matter how wise we are in our own devices. There seems to be a right way to every man, but it leads to death. Everybody dies no matter how right they think they are. But Jesus said, he that believes in my sayings will not see death. And so we submit all our wisdom to God. We submit all our ability to God, all our humanity to God, and he puts us in Christ and we arise with a new kind of wisdom. We arise with a new kind of understanding. We arise with a new kind of love and faith and hope that's in Christ Jesus. We arise in a new way as Jesus arose, and we have the testimony of that in the power of God. And this is the mystery that God, verse 7, even the hidden wisdom, which God... So if you want to really be you know, esoteric about wisdom, the church has all the wisdom. All the wisdom. Wisdom was actually stolen from mankind through the fall of Adam. They were given a phony wisdom. They were given a deceiving wisdom. They were given a wisdom of pride and arrogancy of independence from God. That's not wise at all, I wouldn't think, would you? Once you see how wise God is and how much he loves you and how much wisdom he's brought you into, you'll think, well, I don't know why I ever thought that way ever before. I don't know why I ever leaned on my own understanding when I can trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not unto my own understanding. In all my ways I acknowledge Him and He directs my path with His wisdom and His power and His glory. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and I can be the head and not the tail and my success in life comes from the wisdom that I got from Jesus Christ. So no flesh can glory in His presence. God has us on this earth to be successful. which none of the princes of this world knew. They didn't know it. The most intelligentsia in this world didn't know this. For had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, neither has it uh, ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man. These are the five senses. This is, the, this is just the wisdom of the flesh. I hasn't seen this wisdom. Ear hasn't heard this wisdom. It hasn't entered the heart of man, this wisdom. The things which God has prepared for them that love them. Verse 10. Now that's the verse that's left out most of the time when we're preaching this. They say, well, you know, you never can know what God's up to, you know. His ways are higher than our ways. 
You know, the, you know the, that's just religious intelligence that's trying to be pri- proud and, 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 and trying to be humble in its own pride. Trying to be humble in its own denial of the mystery. Trying to be humble in its own denial of the power of God. Trying to be humble in its own denial of the prosperity life that God has for the servants of the Lord. God delights in the prosperity of His servants. Hallelujah. So God has promised us to be prosperous and to be in health as our soul prospers. That's God's promise. Verse 10, But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Now, if you look in chapter 1, he's talking about that which the Holy Ghost teaches. The Holy Ghost teaches us the things of God in our own hearts. So when we're born again, we're put into Jesus. His wisdom comes on us so we can learn that which is freely given us And I'll read the next verse, and that's what it says right there. Now we have received, verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. Verse 13. Oh, thank God for 13. I love 13, you know. I find the best scriptures in the Bible are 13s. My address is 13 too. But I just found God has got a sense of humor with me. Because then when I get a good verse, I look at it, it's usually 13. You know? Not which man's wisdom teaches. See, the devil hates 13. He hates that number. He tries to make it a bad luck number. No, it's a good, it's a good number. It's a blessing number. I like 13. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, Jesus defeats superstition. The wisdom of God overcomes fear and superstition of man. See, man's superstition and fears are all rooted in, in, in earthly wisdom. And a lot of the church is superstitious, and they don't even know it. The Bible says that they have traditions that make God's word of no effect. Even in giving. They make, they, they make their traditions of giving. The tradition of giving. Giving without expecting anything is a tradition that makes God's blessing canceled in your life. Oh, I'm just going to give. I don't expect anything back. Not if you're cooperating with the wisdom of God, you're not. Because God said, as far as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will always remain. A farmer doesn't sow seed and not expect a harvest. I believe me, you, that when he sows the seed, he's got a combine in the quonset ready to go when the crop comes up. Amen? And when you sow a seed, you better get your combine out and expect to cooperate with God to get the fulfillment of the harvest of that seed. And Paul used money as a seed illustration. He used it as a metaphor of a seed being sown. He that sows sparingly, sow. You know, farming terms, talking about money. So really, you know, you're investing. Just like anybody else who gives money in the world, they're investing. They're expecting to get a return on their investment. God doesn't sow anything without an expectation of a return on your investment. God wants you to get a return. As long as the earth remains, there'll be seed. And if you've got a tradition from man, you will not be blessed by this revelation of truth. Your traditions, your religious traditions will make God's word of sowing and reaping of no effect to you because you think you're so humble in giving and not expecting anything in return. Where Jesus never taught that at all. Didn't teach it ever. He said, give and it shall be given. Now, if you want to be walking in the wisdom of God and the power of God and in the mystery of the new creation, then everything you do will be new. Old things will be passed away. Those old dead traditional things, if anyone be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, old things are passed away. All those old religious stinking thinking ways are passed off. They're passed off. That's how the world thinks. Praise God. That's how religion thinks. That's false humility. And God doesn't like it. He doesn't like false humility. 
and he likes reality. Amen. The Bible says that Jesus came with grace and truth. And that word truth means reality. Jesus came with reality, not just vain traditions of man that don't work and don't do anything and just put people into bondage under some kind of denominational headache, right? If you belong to Jesus, then you have the wisdom of God and the power of God. If you belong to Jesus, uh, you will begin to think like Jesus, and Jesus will give you the mind that he has. Jesus was a seed that was sown into the earth when he died on the cross and he believed he was going to bring many sons to glory through the harvest of his death and resurrection. His, his, his death was a seed sown. Unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it cannot produce anything. So there's the principle of God's wisdom that your giving is living and your income is in your giving, not in your harvest. A farmer knows that his income is in his sowing. He knows that. And that's the wisdom of God. When you get a harvest, your income was actually in your sowing. The harvest came in your sowing. And when Jesus died on the cross, the harvest that he got is us here today in this church. We're his harvest. Amen? I'm his harvest. You're his harvest. Praise God. Jesus died expecting the revelation of his mystery to be preached. And Paul preached it and he was so happy about it that I get to preach this revelation that was hidden for ages and ages. But now is made revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it, they would not have crucified for had they known it. What do we need to know that Satan doesn't want us to know? Had they known it? Known what? That's the question that you have to answer. Had they known it? Known what? That's the question you need to answer. Paul knew the answer to that. Do you know the answer to that? Had they known it? Had they known what the cross of Christ was going to do for the human race? Had they known that? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. What do we need to know that the devil doesn't want us to know? I'll tell you what he doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to know the new you in the cross. He doesn't want you to know the new you in glory. He doesn't want you to know that old things have passed away and everything's become new. And Paul preached his heart out to make that revelation known to the human race. He was the one came up with this revelation. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, he said, these revelations are given to me to preach unto you the unsearchable riches in Christ that the enemy doesn't want you to know how rich you really are in identifying with the death of Jesus. Had he known how rich he was going to make you, he wouldn't have crucified him. Had he known how healed he was going to make you, he wouldn't have crucified. Our healing ministry is in the cross of Jesus. Satan doesn't want people to be healed. Jesus said the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Sickness comes from Satan. Healing comes from God. Satan wants to make you worse. God wants to make you better. Had they known that, and now we know it. We know it, that God is a good God, and every good and perfect gift that comes from above belongs to us through Jesus taking our sins with him on the cross. He has done it. It's a forever settled matter. Hallelujah. And then if you go to first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, we'll close with this. 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is what Paul wanted to make known to the human race, this revelation. This is what Paul wanted to make known that he can make all men see what is this revelation. And we'll go there, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Actually, the last time Sister Minnie was up here ministering, that's what she was ministering on, wisdom. Talking about wisdom. And uh, we need wisdom in the world we're living in. We need wisdom. You know, and the beginning of wisdom is the worship of the Lord, is the acknowledging of the Lord. 
where we get it from. We get wisdom. And even God says that he gives the church, you know, a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom. You know, one word of wisdom will show you how to do things that I have had so much wisdom from God in everything you do. Practical applications in everyday life. Like fixing cars. Whatever you got to do. And, and I know the medical profession, the one who did surgery on me, and I thanked him for it. He says, don't thank me. Thank the Almighty God. He gave me the wisdom to do that. He confessed that. You know, that's a humble thing for a surgeon to say, you know, that he said, don't thank me. Thank the Almighty God. He said, the Almighty God. When my appendix burst and I was in the hospital and I went through that ordeal in 2018, November 20th, I'll never forget that day because it was my anniversary. It's our wedding anniversary. And I was in the hospital, and I just thank God for the wisdom that he gave the surgeon. Amen. And the surgeon gave glory to God. That was, that was, you know, that was the beginning of more wisdom. God bless him. And uh, now let's look at verse 21 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I was fixing my car, you know. I was ready to give up. I, I, I was, my son just got his license last Friday. Due to 16, Independence Day. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I don't have to drive him to Karenport all the time. Don't have to drive him to his hockey practice. He's at a hockey game right now. And uh, so I'm fixing up this Mustang for him. When he gets his license, he can drive it in the summertime, not in the winter, because it's a standard rear-wheel drive and not the best kind of car. See, that's wisdom. <laughs> not the best kind of car to be driving if you first get your license. But I had everything apart, and I was stuck on this one. I could not get the driving steering shaft to line up with the, with the rack and pinion steering. I had everything in place, and I couldn't get it to line up. It just wouldn't line up. And I didn't know how to turn it. And I was just, I said, well, I'm going to give up. Here's the wisdom of God. It comes from the word of God. You know, God's wisdom is to never give up. God's wisdom is to always believe. God's wisdom is to trust in the Lord. You know, and I put my jacket up and I was just ready to walk in the house. And this idea came to me just like, you know, it was just like Jesus talking to Peter. Try it again and do it this way this time. Well, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. I, I just can't get, I, I can't get over this stumbling block here that I'm facing in, in my everyday life situations. It's like the fishermen were fishing and couldn't catch anything. And, and then Peter said, well, okay, Lord, uh, you know, I'm tired, but nevertheless at your word. And I remember the Lord saying that as I was walking up the stairs to go in. And uh, I said, okay. I said, nevertheless at your word, I will go there and do that. He told me to go down there and just turn the wheel an inch. And I had never thought of that. So all I did was turn the wheel an inch, and it just dropped right in. Perfect position. I tightened it up. I got the whole job done that night. And then I got this little button in my garage with a battery in it. It says, that was easy. And I hit that. Tick. That was easy. I have that in the garage just to encourage myself. <laughs> That was easy. It was. When Jesus, it's so easy when you trust in Jesus. It's so easy when you trust in Jesus. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You don't have to be on a treadmill to receive the wisdom of God. You receive it by faith through the grace of God. He gives it to you. One time I had a coffee shop for 13 years. Coffee encounters downtown. Still there. Manager still running it. Then we had two. We had one in Lloyd Minster. In the business, I, 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 I learned to trust God's wisdom all the time. I had an espresso machine that wasn't working, and I, I went to fix it, and I lost a little O-ring. And the little O-ring, you can't operate it without that little O-ring. And I didn't know where it was. And I was just getting all stressed out, and I was running on a treadmill trying to find this part, digging through the office, looking everywhere. And I says, I just got to sit down and hear from the Lord here. I just lifted up my hand and started to praise God. In my office, oh, thank you, Lord. And I started singing a song. It's so easy when you trust in Jesus. Even though I hadn't found it yet, it's so easy when he tells you where it is. It's so easy when you trust. And all of a sudden, a thought came to my mind. Look in the vacuum cleaner. It's in the vacuum cleaner. 
I said, so could it really be in the vacuum cleaner? Yeah, one of my staff, they vacuumed it up. So I looked in there, and there it was, right on the top of everything. Praise God. It might be simple, but I tell you, if God cares about those little things, how much more does he care about the big things in your life? You know, if God cares about your cat, like he does with mine, you know, uh, people think that's trivial. They think, no, you gotta, I wouldn't want to mess with someone who has a God that cares about their cat and cares about their O-ring and their vacuum cleaner, you know. That just shows you these are the foolish things of God that sometimes confound the wives. You know, when you see God in the small things, like the seed, it's a small thing. But you see God producing the forest. It's a big thing. Little things are big things with God's blessing on it. Amen? Okay, so 21 here, we're going to do it. And we're going to close with it. Uh, verse 21 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is what the Lord is giving us his wisdom today. Uh, not the wisdom that man teaches, but the wisdom that the Holy Ghost teaches. Listen to the Holy Spirit today in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the great exchange. That Jesus became sin for us. He didn't just die for our sins. He became the sinner that we were. It doesn't say that he died for our sins. He became sin for us. He became sin for me. He became the sinner that I once was until I received the revelation of his righteousness by faith. So when I receive that, I'm not on a religious treadmill. I'm already seated in heavenly places with Christ. I'm not trying to do something that's already done. God's just trying to get me to believe what the Holy Ghost is teaching me so that I can have faith to live an abundant life. Amen. So I don't have to struggle on a religious treadmill all my life. Amen. I don't have to live under guilt and condemnation and be motivated in a negative way anymore. My life is full of the positive motivation of God's word. It's positive. It's not, I'm going to do this if you don't do that. It's, no, I've already done this. Now get living like that. Amen. I've already done this. Now get living. Amen. He told the, he told the man that, was, that came through the roof that was invalid, his friend's brother. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Rise up and walk. So as soon as you believe that your sins are forgiven, that's when you can really start living without a treadmill. He didn't have to go to a 10-step program on healing, but healing is good to learn, and you learn it in the church by the Holy Ghost teaching of the Word. Praise God. But that guy, as soon as he heard Jesus say to him, your sins are forgiven, he knew that was his key to new living. New living. Praise God. We thank God for his new life today in this house. We thank God that we, we preach Christ and him crucified. We preach Christ and him risen again. We preach the new righteousness that God has given us in Christ. That's his wisdom. That of God are we in Christ Jesus, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, let him that glories, glory in the Lord. Father God, I thank you, Father God, for your salvation in this house today. I uh, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the righteousness that you have imparted unto us through the death of your Son that we receive by faith today. That your faith is living in us so that righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit will be our expression of your love for us. Your love for us gets its expression back through us, that we're now made whole, that we're now made righteous, that we're now rejoicing in Christ Jesus, and God has called us into his kingdom, and we have eternal life, and we shall never perish. And I just thank you, Lord, for delivering us from the powers of darkness, anything that's of the old world, that's of the perishing world, that's of the princes of this world that are coming to nothing, that we are walking in your light and getting brighter and brighter into the perfect day. We thank you, Lord. 
But you've taught your people your word today. You taught your people righteousness and how effective it is in people's lives when they believe that you have become sin for us so that we could live according to what you have finished for us to begin in. You have already finished what you've begun. You've begun a good work in us and you will complete it under the day of Christ. And so thank you, Father God, for the ministry of your word today, for the ministry of revealing to us the mystery that had they known this, they wouldn't have crucified Christ. But now we know it. And I thank you that we're made whole by it. We're made whole. And I just declared the Lord's righteous wholeness over you today through the finished work of Christ. Healing in your body right now, I declare it in Jesus' name. That your body receives that righteous stripe of Christ right there in your body. That it's aligning your organs, it's aligning your nervous system, it's aligning, hallelujah, with perfect health and wholeness. That you're in health when you're in Christ. You're in health when you receive this revelation. This revelation is your healing by the stripes of Jesus today. And I just thank you, Father God, that all weakness and all infirmity is driven out by the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus today. And I thank you, Lord God, you have delivered us from that today. And today is the day of our healing. That as we rise today, Father God, we thank you. We go our way believing. We go our way receiving. We go our way believing that it is so true, that it is so loving, that it is so real, that your love is working in us and healing us from head to toe. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you for those that couldn't make it here that are fighting infirmities and sickness. Lord God, I thank you that they shall rise, that they shall come out, that they shall be whole, that they will take their healing and remove their sicknesses. For it says that you have removed our sicknesses from us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. People are getting healed here today that are here right now, that are here right now. We thank you, Lord, that their believing makes them whole. Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. If you believe what's been preached, it is healing unto you right now. If you believe it, you receive it in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord God. God is calling us unto Jesus. It's amazing when they ask Jesus, they said to Jesus, give us this bread where we will never hunger again. Give us this bread of life. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me, if you want it, come and get it. It's there for you. Whatever's being preached uh, is in the place that your faith can take a hold of it because the things that are seen are just as real as the things that are unseen. And the unseen things are actually eternal and the things that are seen are temporary. But that which is eternal is of God. And you can reach out and you can grab those things that you can't see with your five senses, but you can see with your faith. You can see with your faith that God sent Jesus into this world that you might live through him. And so you take that unseen truth, uh, that revelation that begins to manifest in your physical body because everything that is seen has been made by that which is not seen. And what you don't see now will be revealed because it's real in the word of God. Amen. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe to receive? Jesus had a powerful, read the book of John. There's so many impact statements there. Oh. That you can just take them, just like you take anything in the physical realm. Just like I take this mic or I take this book. or You know, I'm reading the Bible and it's physical, but the truths that are in it are spiritual. And they become realities in your life through faith. They do, through faith. Father God and hallelujah. Are you getting something out of this today? Huh? Do you believe it? That's what God sent Jesus into this world for. It's for you to know the reason of it, the purpose of it, that the enemy doesn't want you to know about it, is that he so loves you that he's calling you into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He so loves you that he wants you to call on him today 
Call on him and receive your healing. Amen. If that's you, you want to receive healing today, put up your hand. Anybody here that needs healing? Anyone here? Just as a statement before God that you're calling on him for your healing. You're calling on him for your healing today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You see all those hands? Thank you, Lord. You brought your bread of life here. And now they're coming to get it, Lord. They're coming into it, Lord. And I thank you for the, for the humble response, the courage that it takes, and the humbleness of mind to receive from God. Thank you for every hand that was raised, Lord, that you'll begin to work on them now and supply their need, every need. And in this case, Father God, physical healing by your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, thank you for your love, that all their healing is in Christ, your Son. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Everybody saved here and your salvation that comes from God includes all the healing you'll ever need. And we just are believing together with you in faith that you are going to walk and as you go, you're being made whole. And I expect to hear testimonies. Testimonies of how you're recovering testimonies of how God's word is working. Let God be true and every man a liar. But the wisdom that the Holy Ghost teaches today is that by his stripes, you have your healing. And you have reached out with your hand to take that provision, that grace that God has given. And I thank you, Lord, that it goes right into your body now. Lord, lay your hand on everyone here today. In Jesus' name, I release your healing power and I thank you that you are doing. Amen.